Praise God. Welcome to Limerick City Church here tonight. We've got a guest speaker, and I really want you to give us your ears to listen intently. I believe this is going to be very timely with all that is happening in our world at this time. We're at an extraordinary hour in world history, church history, and I believe in each of our lifetimes. We've never stood where we're standing now, and I'm very excited about this night. I believe it's in the will of God, the purpose of God for each of our lives. If you're watching this afterwards, I believe it's very timely and that God will speak to you and impact your life. Going back to the early 1990s, and I think it may have been 1995, um, I first encountered Gary Ka and was deeply impacted by what he shared at that time. It was like a word in season. I believe now, 30 uh, odd years later, it is even more timely and more impactful. It was 1995 in Scotland. I heard him speak, share many different things. And when I heard that, it engraved itself upon me. It definitely marked me for the rest of my uh, Christian walk. In a, a Sunday night, I believe it was, in the borders of Scotland, I spoke to him after uh, the meeting. He had a document there with the UN stamp upon it with a map of the whole world broken down into 10 regions. I wanted to see that map. He mentioned it um, in what he'd shared that night. I wanted to see it, and he made a point of pointing it out, giving me the facts, giving me the details, and that impacted me in a remarkable way in understanding Bible prophecy and what was happening in my lifetime, in my day. And I do pray tonight will have the same impact on you. Just a couple of things here that um, Brother Gary also wrote two books, En Route to Global Occupation and The New World Religion. I consider these two books to be classics. And I don't lightly say that. I've got several thousand books on my shelves here. I've got hundreds of books on Bible prophecy. Very few of them I'll read a second time. But I want to tell you, I've read these books several times. I think all of you should have them on your shelf, at least as a reference book. And they are filled with vital information, not just back in the 90s, but these are as timely now. And I consider them such. In fact, I started looking at this this afternoon and went, boy, I'm going to be reading this again before I go to bed tonight. You that know me know that I don't likely say that. I, I am scrutinizing I am very, uh, I test uh, what comes out in Bible prophecy and all the rest. I have very little time for things that happen uh, year after year. But these things, I believe, are timely, important, and they're changing our entire world. Uh, Gary Ka also does um, um, four uh, newsletters he puts out every year. So all, all of this stuff is there. But I want you to hear this message. I want to hand over to him. And especially, I've asked him to start with his own background, his family. And this is the reason why I wanted to do that so much. When I heard it uh, all those years ago, 25 plus years ago, and I heard about how God had prepared him, I could see that the message God gave him and how God prepared him went hand in hand. And I believe this is a providential work of God to prepare a vessel to give that vessel a message to deliver in his generation. So I believe what he's just about to share here in opening is very important about his own parents, his own life, even as a young boy, and how God prepared him to deliver a message. And I believe it's so timely. And all of our friends and other nations, churches, leaders, as well as Christians, and here in Limerick City, I believe that there is something so vital for you to hear so you understand the hour that you are living in. Gary Ka, I welcome you to Ireland for the first time. You're very welcome, brother. I appreciate your ministry, your integrity. Many say many things in this art, but don't have integrity and uprightness. But I've watched you from afar over this 25 plus years, and I respect your integrity about money, how you research all of these things. And that's why we're having this meeting tonight, because I believe you've got something very vital to share. I'm going to hand straight over to you, and we pray that God will bless us and touch many lives through tonight. Brother Gary. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Keith. 
Uh, it's my honor and privilege uh, to be in Ireland for the very first time, even though it's virtually, I'm virtually there. Um, and it's, it's hard to believe it's been uh, over 25 years, going on 30 years since uh, that evening in Scotland, which I actually remember very well. Um, it's, it's difficult to forget the people over there that I met on that occasion, and we're still in contact with many of them to this day. So it is a real uh, privilege. Um, I do want to make a quick comment about my nose. Uh, probably you all uh, have recognized that I have a bandage over my nose. That's because I just had some uh, skin cancer removed a few days ago. And I think uh, you can trust me, uh, you would rather look at the bandage than if I had it off. Um, it, it's not a pretty sight, uh, but we thank the Lord that um, uh, all that got taken care of. And so I'm, I'm healing from the inside out. Um, as Keith uh, mentioned, uh, I'm going to begin with uh, a bit of my, my personal testimony and story of how I got started in, in studying uh, globalization and things involving uh, world government. And then um, when uh, Keith and I have our discussion, we'll begin with Ukraine because that's so important right now with what's going on there. In fact, I was watching the headlines right up until uh, I sat down here and, uh, and then we'll have a time for Q&A as well. But I would actually like to begin with a couple of passages of scripture uh, that I believe are so relevant right now. Uh, the first one being Revelation chapter 13, uh, beginning the second half of verse 2 and reading on down through verse 8. And I just want to make sure, is the sound coming through okay? Everything's good? All right. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, where in the Bible is world government spoken of? Well, the term itself is not mentioned directly, but it's described right here in this passage. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshiped the dragon, who here is uh, symbolizing Satan, because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. That is all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So here you have described a type of end times global political system or administration that will use its economic and military power to enforce a type of religious worship. Ultimately, it is a spiritual matter. It's about religion and receiving the worship of man. And we know that a lot of deception will accompany this because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. So I'm going to go ahead and come over to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to begin reading from verses three on. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. 
At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. There's that word again. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And then down in verse uh, 23, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So that really the theme of that chapter and what Jesus was, was trying to get across was that there would be tremendous deception in the days immediately prior to his return. And it appears from Matthew chapter 24 that a good bit of that deception will take place in his name, in the name of Christ. People claiming to be Christians, teaching uh, false doctrines, uh, people doing all kinds of things in the name of Christ. So just because something is, is done or is said in the name of Christ does not mean that it is of Christ. And so that this is going to be, I think, the biggest challenge in the days ahead. Uh, we see even many uh, people coming from uh, New Age backgrounds, occult backgrounds, um, who've been entrenched in that thinking for, for many years, sometimes even use the term Christ. Uh, but typically, they mean something different than Jesus Christ, the person and the Son of God, when they're talking about uh, Christ. In fact, it is widely taught in occult circles that we can all become Christ and take part of the Christ consciousness. So we are living in, in these kinds of days that Jesus was uh, uh, speaking of. And then to hear the talk about rumors of wars, uh, we're certainly witnessing that right now. And there have been times in history before, but never where the world is this small and where something that happens halfway around the world affects all of us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. Um, but I just wanted to share those two passages of scripture regarding uh, uh, the prophecy concerning world government and also the deception that would accompany all these uh, developments. My parents came from Europe. My father at age 12 fled from the communists in Croatia. At the time, they were called the partisans. Uh, they ended up becoming the communists. Uh, he only had about one to two days notice, he and his family. They threw a few belongings on the back of a uh, wagon. Uh, some of their neighbors had covered wagons. Uh, others did not. Uh, they formed a wagon train and um, ran for their lives and wove in and out of enemy lines. Uh, they just tried to survive. There was no safe place, really. Uh, very much like what's going on in Ukraine today. But they made it out. They eventually found a place uh, where they thought they might be safe, uh, having traveled through Hungary and into Austria. And they camped out in a mountainous region in Austria. Uh, but my father was placed in a boarding school. Um, he was about 13 years old now. And within a few weeks, uh, he thought, we're, we're sure not learning a lot. Uh, not much math or language skills or anything, but we're doing a lot of marching and drills. Well, then one day he was walking past the headmaster's office and he overheard him speaking to the man who was second in command and came to discover that they were planning to send all these kids, roughly 12 to 16 year old kids on the Eastern front as cannon fodder for Hitler. And my father decided that he had not come that far and fled from the communists to now go fight for Hitler on the Eastern Front. And so that night, he and his friend jumped out of a two-story window and ran for their lives. He ran over 20 miles, uh, but he was street smart enough to realize that if he went straight home, they'd probably be waiting for him. And so he stayed about a third of a mile away in some woods 
where he had a view of his house. And sure enough, by the time he got there, uh, the secret police were already there talking to his mother, uh, trying to find him. And so for several weeks, he slept in the barn, uh, in a nearby barn, without letting the people living there know that he was actually there. And it wasn't too long after that that the war actually uh, ended. So you can imagine, I grew up hearing about these stories and uh, what, not only what my father went through, but my mother grew up under Hitler in the southern part of Germany. And her father, my grandfather, was outspoken against Hitler to the point where on one occasion, uh, some uh, henchmen uh, showed up in their little village looking for my grandpa. Uh, they went to the mayor's office and the mayor, fortunately, was a friend of the family. My mom and his daughter were best friends, so he was not about to, to rat on my uh, grandpa. So he sent the, the secret police off in a different direction to a neighboring town. You can't make this up. It's like in the movies. And, and then he immediately found my grandpa and said, you've got to get out of here. They're looking for you. And so he camped out in a nearby forest for several days. Um, till the coast was clear. So on both sides, both my mother and my father's side, they went through quite a lot. And uh, I'm here today because God in his providence uh, protected uh, my father as well as my mother and made it possible for them to come here to the U.S. where I was born uh, some years after they came over. So I remember at family gatherings with other cousins, uh, they would be talking about these kinds of things. And, and so by the time I was in sixth grade, I was quite interested in, in international affairs. Uh, I remember even watching the evening news on television with my father, which probably isn't typical of an 11 year old, but uh, I was just interested in, in these kinds of things. And I had accepted the Lord uh, Jesus Christ as my savior. Um, uh, the summer before entering sixth grade, and that next school year, I have to have a Christian school teacher in a public school, which these days is quite rare over here, and uh, she gave us uh, our first history lessons, and some of it dealt with World War II, so between what my parents shared and what she spoke of in, uh, in the class, I was so um, impacted by it. I remember sitting there in my classroom and I prayed silently to the Lord and I said, God, if anything were to ever happen, like what happened in Europe during World War II, uh, here in the United States, I promise I will take a stand for you regardless of the cost. And, and I meant that. Um, but as a, an 11 or 12 year old, you never really uh, expect God to take you up on something like that. But I'm here to tell you that God hears the prayers of, of children when they come from a sincere heart. So now let's fast forward over many years. Um, through no coincidence, the door opened for me uh, to interview for a position with our state government where I would be working under our lieutenant governor, which would be kind of like the vice president of our state. Uh, I live in the state of Indiana. Those of you who are familiar geographically with uh, uh, that part of the United States, we're between Chicago and Cincinnati uh, in Indianapolis. So uh, I went in, did an interview. Many other people interviewed as well. Uh, but when I left, I, I knew I had the job. It's like the Lord confirmed it in my spirit. So I began celebrating even before they, they called me. I just knew it. And sure enough, a week or two later, I heard back from them and they said, the position is yours. So I became the Europe and Middle East trade specialist for our state government. And I would travel overseas extensively uh, throughout Europe and eventually the Far East as well, uh, doing everything possible to um, increase the exports of our products made here in our state in order to uh, create more jobs here locally. So it was an economic type of, uh, an economic development type of uh, position. Well, although I was on the payroll of the state government, when I traveled overseas, my meetings were set up through our state department, through the, our embassies, our US embassies. And so I dealt a lot with uh, the people in the commercial sections of our embassies. And the, the very first year, in fact, on my very first trip overseas, 
Uh, I already had some encounters with, with people uh, working at the embassies. Uh, sometimes we would have dinner together. Quite often we'd have dinner together. Sometimes they even uh, would invite me to their homes because when you spend uh, two or three or four days together, you, you kind of get to know people you know, and establish a, a rapport. And um, some of these people would open up and, and share about where they're, where they're at politically. And uh, sometimes we would then talk about economics and where the world was headed on that front. And then occasionally we'd also discuss spiritual matters. And so I, I learned early on that you can learn a lot more by asking questions and sometimes just being quiet rather than revealing right up front where you, you stand on things. Otherwise, sometimes people will clam up and they won't share any, anything else. And um, I discovered that quite a few of these people working for our embassies uh, were in favor of there being someday a type of global government system. Uh, through an empowered United Nations or perhaps another organization that would arise, but they were not against that. And I also discovered that for the most part, those people who held that view were also not very fond of Bible-believing Christians or conservative Jews. In fact, they had a strong disdain for the nation Israel. So I found that to be quite interesting, especially when you come from my background with what with what my parents went through. And so I just kind of tucked that away in the back of my mind. And I remember thinking, what are these people doing working for our government, you know, in these key positions in the State Department? Now, fortunately, I also met some Christian believers. Uh, they were few and far between, uh, but they did exist. And um, they had some of the same concerns that, that I did uh, because they were surrounded to a large extent by globalists. And FYI, I learned later on through research that ever since around World War II, our State Department has been saturated by globalists, which explains uh, a lot in terms of why we are headed in the overall direction that we are headed in here in the United States uh, toward uh, globalism. Anyway, um, after a couple of years on my job, uh, I felt that I needed to do something. I really felt convicted by the Lord. Uh, but where do you begin? You know, do, do, do you stand on a street corner and start talking about this coming new world order? You know, people would think uh, you're crazy. And so um, I remember praying for a period of time. It wasn't that long, maybe just a, a couple or three weeks. And all of a sudden, one day, a good friend of mine who worked in our secretary of state's office, who happened to be a, a believer, uh, asked me to come and share with their Bible study group about some of these things that I had learned. And um, there were maybe 10 or 12 people in that Bible study group, but it included some Christian state legislators and people that worked in various capacities in, in our state government. And they were quite interested in this subject matter. And, and so some of them invited me to share at other Bible study groups that they were part of. And then Sunday evenings and churches and, and this whole thing just started to move forward. Uh, it was not a door I pushed down. It's just, it was really something that the, the Lord did. And so that continued for about 10 months or so. And then one day, quite unexpectedly, I was called into the office of, um, of one of our uh, leaders in our state government at the Department of Commerce. And he asked me to take a seat. And um, he said, is it true, Gary, that you've been speaking out against world government? I said, well, yes. Mm -hmm. During my, my free time, I have done some of that in recent months. He said, well, don't you think that this possible trend toward a world government isn't just a natural evolution of the progress of mankind? And I thought, wow, um, no. Uh, because I had already uncovered organizations that were blatantly pushing this agenda. And they were planning and scheming and conducting meetings. And, and so I shared with him and he let me talk for quite a while because I, I think he was interested to see what I knew about this. And then uh, finally he cut me off and uh, he said, as long as you work for this administration, you will not talk about any of these things 
to any groups, regardless of their size, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. Is that understood? And before I could even think of a response, he said, you've been a tremendous asset to our administration, and we do not want to lose you, but the choice is yours. And that's how the meeting ended. So in short, I was given an ultimatum uh, to keep quiet about this subject matter or else I'm, I'm gone. And um, I left my office or, or his office and went back to my office and just stared out of the window uh, for a while. And even now, it just is surreal. It's as if I can remember that moment so well. I was on the seventh floor and it overlooked our state capitol building. It was a beautiful office. Um, and I just stared out the window and I thought, I can't believe this is happening, you know, and I began thinking through the ramifications of, of what this could mean. So I called my friend over in the Secretary of State's office, told him what had happened. We had lunch together and that's when I told him he couldn't believe it. And um, so finally, after much prayer, I decided to take one more trip overseas that was already planned. I had already committed to it. And this would be a trip uh, where I would be part of a delegation uh, led by our Secretary of State. And um, interestingly enough, it was to Finland, Russia, and China. And so I wasn't going to miss that opportunity. Uh, so I thought, I'll pray about it, uh, take that trip, and, and uh, ask the Lord to help me make a decision through all of that. Uh, but I thought, you know, this might be my last trip ever working for the government, so I want to make it count. So I, I asked the Lord, if there's anything unique or special you want me to do on this trip, please make it clear. I got a call a few days later from a Messianic fellowship here in Indianapolis. They said, we, we heard you're going into Russia. Is that true? I said, well, yeah, as part of a delegation. They said, we happen to have some uh, Russian Hebrew translation New Testaments. Would you be willing to smuggle them in for us? And so, and, and so uh, I said, okay. After I prayed about it, I, I got back with them. I said, I, I'd love to. And a few days later, I met some Jewish people who had just immigrated to the United States from Russia, and they found out that I was going to be going to Russia. So they said, would you take some clothes in for us? Because we have some very poor friends there that could really benefit from that. And so I said, okay, I'd be happy to do that. So I met them and they pulled this big suitcase out of a trunk and it was full of women's clothing. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, if they stop me at the border and I've, I've got all these women's clothing, what am I gonna say? But I, I packed as much of it as I could into my suitcase and I found out later on it was for them to sell over there in order to get some money so they could live. So I went into Russia with Bibles and women's clothing and um, having no idea what would happen. But um, and I'm not going to go any further on that story because that could go on quite a while. But we had some amazing meetings in Russia uh, with Christian believers, a pastor, and also with the Jewish refusenik. And I was able to tape that conversation about what had happened to them. Um, he was demoted to a garbage collector from being a top engineer in the country simply for requesting permission uh, to immigrate to Israel from Russia. So long story short, I came back from that trip. And as I was sitting in the airport in San Francisco, uh, the Lord just dropped words into my mind of uh, what I should write for a letter of resignation. And so I wrote that letter. Uh, when I got back to Indianapolis, I handed it in and uh, gave them about three weeks notice. And then I left my position. And so I'm going to be giving you the short version of the story. There's a lot more that happened, um, but I did leave my job at that time and uh, began uh, to do further research and writing because I believe God was calling me to write a book to document all of these things that I had learned. And I wanted to do it right. I thought I could do it maybe two years took six years because of um, the, really the spiritual warfare that we encountered. Uh, we'd never experienced anything like it. When, when I stepped out to move forward with this project, uh, it's as if the gates of hell were unleashed against us, my wife and I. And I remember during one eight month period, my wife was in three car accidents, one of them totaling our car. So, so much of my time was consumed just uh, dealing with insurance companies and body shops and things like that. 
and all kinds of things happened. Uh, but uh, gradually over time by sticking with it and many people praying for us and persevering, the book finally got finished and uh, it came out in uh, late 1991, early 92, somewhere in there. Um, and along the way, I, I need to backtrack just a little bit. The Lord worked it out that I was invited to join two of the organizations that were actually involved in this agenda pushing toward world government. So I actually had an, uh, received an inside look of sorts. One was operating within our government. The other one was outside of our government. And so much of that documentation ended up going into the book. And so I believe God and his sovereignty allowed things to take a little bit longer so that all this could be collected and, and uh, be, be brought forward to the public. Um, the organization uh, that is part of our government, I was in for seven years as a volunteer. Uh, the first four years, uh, I was gradually learning some things and flags went up. The last three years, I had secret clearance. And that's when I learned the most. They wanted me to renew my term after that three-year period, but I had seen <clears throat> and heard enough. <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't want to be part of it. The people who briefed us in our meetings were globalists, um, belonging to groups like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Council on Foreign Relations. One gentleman who spoke to us at a luncheon, it took so long for them to introduce him because they listed all the awards he had received from the United Nations. And uh, he made statements during the luncheon uh, that I couldn't even believe he was saying. One of them was, and this is almost verbatim, he said that in order for the United States to be successful in the coming new world order, we would have to move away from our Judeo-Christian ethic and embrace the religious philosophies of the East. He actually said that, which told me he was very comfortable with the idea that, you know, he assumed everybody in the room was on the same page with him. And uh, uh, me and one other gentleman, uh, weren't, but it seemed as if everybody else uh, was. So, and there's much more I learned uh, in that organization, but I think the Lord used that to help me um, frame my research and help me to understand better how all the pieces tied together. And then um, the other organization involved uh, mayors of prominent cities, uh, some former UN officials, ambassadors, some religious figures, even the former president of the World Council of Churches belonged to this organization. So they covered the, the religious bases. Uh, it was very interfaith, uh, Muslims, Hindus, uh, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, all involved. Um, that organization that I talk about extensively in, in my first book, In Route to Global Occupation, um, had actually published a world constitution for world government. And in it, they laid out uh, their goals. And uh, so this has been around for a long time, but it's, it's been tweaked. They continue to you know, improve it, make changes and so forth. But it simply showed me how far along all of this was. This was back in the 1980s and early 90s. So this is not something that just came up yesterday. The groundwork for this has been laid over a number of decades. And I mean, let me just make a couple more comments about that organization before moving on. Uh, they put out a list of 49 reasons for why we need world government. And that was very helpful to me because it told me where they were headed, what excuses they would eventually give to the public for why we have to move in this direction of UN empowerment, world government. Of the 49 reasons, something like 13 or 14 of them had to do with the environment. So I knew that somehow that would tie into this agenda. We've got to come together as one world, empower the United Nations to give them unprecedented powers to save mankind from the destruction of the environment. That would be one of, the, one of their narratives. I heard the term global warming and climate change several years before it was ever mentioned once publicly to the best of my knowledge. Another um, aspect of, of their agenda, and that was part of their 49 reasons, had to do with the pursuit of world peace, to stop the wars and the fighting. Just think, if there could be a world government 
countries wouldn't be able to fight each other any longer because there would just be one army over the entire world. Well, that's true, but who would be in charge of that army? And there would be no place left to run or go to if it ends up being a bad regime, which this definitely would be, considering that many of the people in the leadership positions were heavily involved in the occult. Uh, the top three of them were directly tied into an organization, believe it or not, that ended with a, a group called Lucifer Publishing Company out of New York City. Um, and that was through an organization in India called World Union that had established a special relationship with an organization in London called World Goodwill that was founded by the same people who founded Lucifer Publishing Company. Now, it took me a while and some research to uncover all that, but it, it was quite mind bending, as you can imagine, uh, uh, discovering that. So these people may have convinced themselves that they're doing something good. Uh, only God knows their full motives. But I can tell you that, uh, again, they see Christians as being the obstacles to what they want to achieve. So we can kind of see where all this is, is headed. Uh, two of the other reasons they gave um, was the economy. They were anticipating an eventual global financial collapse, which would then justify and give a reason to supplant the existing world economic system with a brand new economic system, unlike anything we've seen before. So you're looking at a one world government, a one world religion, or, or a one world economy, uh, and a lot of this playing on the environmental agenda as well, and uh, eventually a one world religion, or at the very least a coming together of the world's religions and a type of interfaithism. They realized that had to be accomplished or else it'd be very difficult to bring about a world government and a global uh, economic system. So this is where most of their efforts have gone in, in, into, into these areas. And again, I can share a lot more, um, but I'm just summarizing. Once my book came out, I thought, okay, Lord, I did what you called me to do. I thought I was pretty much done. I had no idea what would happen next. Well, the first two months after the book came out, uh, the Lord opened the doors for me to be on about 40 talk shows. I mean, it, it went so fast. And uh, my publisher was concerned about my safety. And in fact, um, they had urged me initially to write the book under a pen name. But then shortly before the book was released, they said, on second thought, we think it's better if you come out with the book under your own name. And we'll just put you on as many talk shows as quickly as possible to get this message out. And so that's what we ended up doing. And so um, after that, uh, the first year, um, I was on approximately 180 talk shows, and some of them went out on hundreds of stations at a time. So it really went out quite quickly. Uh, our lives were a whirlwind at that, at that point in time. And um, it continued at a similar pace for about two or three years. And then a lot of pushback began, well, even before then. Uh, not just on me, but other people uh, who had begun speaking out by that time publicly. Uh, there was a phenomenon going on in the U.S. at that time. A lot of conservative talk shows were beginning to be formed. Uh, Rush Limbaugh, you may have heard of him. Uh, he began to become popular around that time as an example. And so the Clinton administration was in power, and they began realizing if they let this go on, uh, they're going to lose a grip on things because a lot of what they were doing uh, began to be exposed. And so they began to crack down in, in a pretty harsh way. I'll just say that. And uh, that's really when, when things began to get nasty uh, between uh, political and Christian conservatives and those in power in Washington. Uh, so it didn't start with the Trump administration. It goes back uh, to the 90s, really. When the, when the Clintons were in there, that's when a lot of this began publicly uh, to be exposed. Then between the years 2006 and 2016, the last two years of the George Bush administration and the eight years of the Obama administration, the globalists made an enormous amount of headway. They began to move forward much more quickly because they had most of the key positions in Washington locked up by then. And so they were able to move. It was still mostly behind the scenes, but uh, they were getting the final pieces put in place. Uh, I believe these forces did not expect Trump to get in power. 
Uh, once he did, he began to undo some of their agenda. So love him or hate him. I know he's a, a, a different um uh, a different kind of being, uh, the way he acts and, and talks, but he did uh, a, a good amount of damage to the to the globalists, and as a result, he didn't make it in for for a second term. Uh, but as you probably all are aware, uh, the Biden administration has wasted no time at just being in office for one year. Everything they have done during that time, uh, really, to to weaken our national sovereignty as a nation, and uh, to cause all kinds of uh, just almost unbelievable things that are going on now in our country. And uh, so that, that brings us uh, to where we're at right now. And, uh, um, and we'll come back to this, to Ukraine, but I just wanna make this comment briefly. I honestly believe that the Ukraine situation could have been avoided. Um, Putin saw the weakness of this administration and how they pulled out of Afghanistan and everything that happened. And that same month, he, he, he began to move. He began to put troops in place in Ukraine um, back in the, in the uh, late summer. And, um, and then also, and this is just my personal opinion, and some of you may disagree with me on this, but I believe for the sake of the Ukrainian people, they would have been well served if they would have taken a position very similar to Finland. Finland is a very pro-Western country. They have good trade relationships with the West, but they are also not at all a perceived threat to Russia. Russia understands they will probably never be invaded from Finland. Uh, but by talking so much about Ukraine perhaps coming into NATO and, and that really being spotlighted, especially in the last few months, it gave Putin the excuse that he needed and was looking for to make a run uh, at Ukraine, in my opinion. Uh, uh, and so, you know, now, I mean, it's, it's done, it's happening, uh, we can't go back, uh, but I do believe the Ukrainian people are going to put up a, a strong fight, and we really need to be praying for them, uh, because I think many of them just didn't see this coming. They, they, they didn't think it would, it would come to this point. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a bit, but to wrap up this um, segment, uh, before going any further, uh, I think it would be good to share a few passages of scripture because a lot of this information uh, we understand is very heavy and it can be quite dark on the one hand, although on the other hand, we do realize the prophecies of scripture are right at the threshold of being fulfilled. And so um, we know the Bible is true because it described these kinds of things uh, that are happening today. But I also want to share a few uh, passages that are very encouraging and have been encouraging to me over the years. Uh, one of them we find in Ephesians chapter 6. I'll just uh, read a few of the verses beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. And the picture we get here is of Christians who are digging their heels in and saying, I am not budging on my beliefs in Jesus Christ. I'm going to stand firm. Nothing is going to dissuade me. I know whom I have believed, and I'm going to stay faithful to him to the very end, no matter what. Another uh, passage we find in 1 Timothy chapter 6, trying to find it here, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. 
it tells us we're in a battle. It's a, it's a fight to the end, spiritually speaking. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Frequently in the New Testament, the tendency for Christians to fear is countered in, in Paul's writings and, and also the other authors of the New Testament. Uh, another, probably my favorite passage of scripture, James 1.12 Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So if we stand firm to the end, we're promised an incredible reward that we cannot even fathom on this side of heaven. God is very good at rewarding his own. Uh, and, and, you know, our imaginations cannot even fathom uh, what it's going to like to be in God's presence. But there will be a reward at the end of this struggle. We just don't fight and, and die and then barely make it into heaven. God is looking out for us and is watching over us. Um, another passage, first, um, or I mean, uh, Philippians. Philippians 1, 20 and 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Again, we shouldn't have fear of death, because we're going to be in the presence of the Lord immediately, uh, if that uh, were to happen, if, if we were to be killed for our faith, or if we die a natural death. Uh, we should have the peace of God that transcends. Romans 8, 35, 39. And just one more passage after this. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That pretty much says it all, doesn't it? I mean, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And, and so I just wanna, uh, wanted to share those with you. And... Uh, maybe one, just one more, Daniel 11.32, those who do wickedly, and this is speaking about the very end of times, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he, the Antichrist, shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So just because things are going to get more difficult in the world doesn't mean we as believers stop doing things. There will be amazing things that happen moving forward uh, under the banner of Christ. It'll be under difficult circumstances, but I believe many are yet uh, to come into the kingdom. And so we have our work cut out for us, and we know that the Lord is with us in that process. So I think that's a good place to wrap up this segment. I, I know I went longer uh, than I was planning to, but... Uh, Let's go ahead, uh, Pastor Keith, and, and um, talk a little bit about Ukraine, if you're ready to do that. Amen, brother. First of all, you made my head swirl, and then you made my heart glad with those scriptures. And uh, I, I think we really do need that. Um, when we begin to look at this, if this is true, and I believe it is, what you're sharing, and what God allowed you to find in this world government plan, it is so serious. I think some people could go, it's impossible. Surely it can't be. And I think that is the deception partly of this is that people think it's too big, too organized. But moving on to this next section, can I just ask, as we move to Ukraine, and it's the issue of the hour, it's what's happening. All the eyes of the world are on Ukraine. They're looking 
at the bear invading uh, poor little Ukraine and the West is uniting. Now, in the light of what you're saying and what we're dealing with tonight, it rewrites things from the average person. Most people in the West at the minute are getting angry at Putin. They're getting angry at Russia. They're see all they're seeing is an invasion of Ukraine. Do you look at it differently? And all that you've seen over the years and all that you've researched, are you looking at that differently as far as these Western nations uh, like Biden and America and the, the EU and all of this? Doesn't all that you're saying tonight put it on a very different setting uh, concerning what is going on at this time? Yes, there, I, there's so much more to it. Um, I just put out a, a bulletin, a news bulletin, and I, I posted this uh, on our website, which, by the way, is GaryCod.org, just my name.org. Uh, it's called Russia versus Ukraine. I wrote this uh, one week ago uh, this morning, uh, Friday, February 18th, and I'm just going to quote a couple of paragraphs from here. Um, the globalists have lost momentum as people are now quickly waking up to their fraudulent COVID pandemic and their broader global reset agenda. And this is an agenda. In short, globalists need another crisis, a crisis they can use to precipitate their next false narrative, a crisis they desperately need in order to force us into their planned one world government financial system. If Russia moves against Ukraine, the West will impose strict sanctions against Russia. That's in the beginning phases now, and it's going to be stepped up more even later today. This could lead to a cyber attack against U.S. institutions and vital resources and also against European allies, either by Russia and possibly China, or if we really want to think conspiratorially, even perhaps by certain intelligence agencies who are promoting this one world government uh, element, and they want to see this crisis come about. Regardless, I believe this is where we're headed. Uh, the next step likely will be a, a cyber attack. I hope it doesn't happen, but such an attack would almost certainly trigger a financial collapse and here in the United States possibly lead to martial law. At that point, all bets are off, anything could happen. Politically conservative Christians, Jews, and other patriots would be targeted, and a form of Marxist socialism would be imposed. Um, people, believers in Europe and in other parts of the world, maybe don't fully realize how radical things have become in the U.S. Uh, this current administration is completely beholden to far, far left progressives. Several of them have come out and said that they're Marxists. So this is not even something I'm guessing about. And um, it, it's almost unbelievable that he that Biden was able to come into office, but he's not acting on his own. He's got all kinds of, of health issues. Uh, uh, he's very wobbly on his feet. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. You know that. I mean, but he is surrounded by powerful people who have basically put him in there as a puppet. And he's very blackmailable because of all the corruption. And so he will do and say whatever they want him to. He's just an out front um, person who can take the heat for all the things that are being uh, done in the US right now. Uh, things that don't make sense. 1.8 million illegal aliens flooding over our southern border last year, unchecked. Between 10 to 15% of them with COVID at a time when they were asking all Americans to wear masks, they were allowing people coming in illegally. Uh, by the way, they weren't just from Mexico and Latin American countries, but they, there were people from at least 30 different countries, including some countries that are, uh, have terrorist status that we know came into the United States through the Southern border. And um, uh, they're completely going, unpunished. There, there's a push right now even to give them voting rights without being U.S. citizens. I mean, I don't know of any other country that does something like that, but that's where things stand now. Um, and then there's the stopping of our energy supply so that even to, as of today, this moment, we are importing oil from Russia and paying them for it. 
a year and a half ago, we were completely um, uh, energy independent. But one of the first things Biden did when he came into power was uh, he cracked down uh, on oil drilling in the country, reintroduced a lot of red tape, shut down a Keystone pipeline that was going to bring oil in from Canada and from North and South Dakota here in the States, shut it all down. And as a result, we've become somewhat dependent on Russia and OPEC once again. Um, you, you don't do that kind of thing unless you're intentionally trying to damage a country or, or move it in a certain direction. And so the, the U.S. economy was humming along. We had 3% unemployment rate. Um, it, things were buzzing along. And you cannot introduce a new global financial system when an economy is that strong. It has to be slowed down and, and brought uh, to a standstill so that the globalists have an excuse to introduce this great reset, as they're calling it, this new uh, economic system with a new uh, electronic currency system, a cashless system. It will be cashless if they have their way. I know that for a fact, 100 um, percent. You know, something could happen to throw a wrench into things, but I know that is their plan to introduce a fully automated electronic currency system internationally. And then, of course, uh, the, the global system uh, would know every single purchase you make, you know, and have full control. So it, the number one way to get control of people is through their finances. So uh, this war is going to help set the stage for that, in my opinion. Uh, COVID only got them to a certain point. It did a lot of damage to our economy over here. The unemployment rate is, is, is quite high. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years now. And a lot of bad things going on with the economy. And, and that's gonna spread uh, around the world. But uh, people began to wise up and realize all the contradictions uh, taking place over here regarding the, the, the COVID agenda. And the very people who were the harshest and the most stringent on everybody else, uh, they're not playing by any of their own rules. Uh, they have a whole different set of rules for themselves. Uh, and the CDC, we just learned uh, two weeks ago, uh, our Center for Disease Control had covered up a lot of vital information regarding the vaccines and also uh, how many of people who have been vaccinated who are, who are getting COVID. Uh, our son-in-law is a respiratory therapist. Uh, recently, he told me we have 11 people in, in his hospital uh, who are on ventilators uh, because of COVID. Seven of them had been vaccinated, the other four had not been. They are now regularly dealing with more people who've been vaccinated with severe cases of COVID than unvaccinated. And the CDC has been keeping a lid on the kind of data that would reveal this. And so people are just fed up here in the States and, and they've kind of rebelled. Um, and so uh, this current administration realizing that they're losing momentum needed another crisis. And it's almost as if Putin was egged on. I'm not saying he, I know that Putin wanted to go into Ukraine anyway. Uh, I, I, I do believe he wanted Ukraine, wants Ukraine to be part of the buffer zone around, around Russia. That's part of the Russian doctrine is to have one country all the way around it, a number of countries, but uh, one country between Russia and their adversaries stretching all the way around their perimeter. And uh, the talk of Ukraine uh, becoming a NATO member, and then of course, possibly even having missiles located on Ukrainian soil aimed at Russia. I knew that wasn't gonna fly. It gave, it gave Putin the excuse he, he wanted to be able to go in. And so no surprise there uh, at all. Um, that being said, um, I want to throw it back to you, uh, Pastor Keith, uh, any question you might have, or if you want me to go a little further into that. Yes, brother, we, we could just sit here uh, all night and listen to this, but it really is a volatile situation. Just um, in the past weeks in Britain and Ireland, they started to lift all of the COVID restrictions. We had it so tight here in Ireland, 93% vaccinated. Um, up until a few weeks ago, I couldn't go in a restaurant without a, a vaccine. So it's been very, very tight, very heavy in Ireland and almost no opposition whatsoever. 
and everyone was shocked over Christmas. COVID hit quite hard. We knew lots of people. And um, within weeks, they were lifting all of the regulations. We were allowed to walk into the restaurant. Now, this coming Monday, they're removing masks within the entire nation. Same with Britain and uh, other nations are doing it. So I know America's going down. We're suddenly coming into freedom. We've been in this two years now, but it seems like we've walked straight out of this into this Russian-Ukrainian crisis. And you go, this is bigger than anything with Ukraine being the breadbasket of Europe and all the natural resources. It's remarkable when you research this, that Ukraine is the most remarkable nation in Europe for all the resources, um, grain, wheat, everything else, uh, fuel, all of these things are sitting there. And um, you you can say, do, why do you think the globalists would do it? Why, why would they target this nation whenever it's going to literally damage? If this moves on and gets worse, it's literally prices and fuel and food is going to go through the roof it's going to jump even within maybe weeks whatever why do you think that they're doing this because it's obviously damaging the west it's not just to damage the russia so wh why do you think that is well if he would have moved on any other country uh that's a nato member then you're looking at full-out war uh, right from the get-go um, Ukraine was talking about coming into NATO, but they hadn't done it yet. And so if he was going to in, in invade a country and take it back, Ukraine is a very populous country, 40 million people. Um, they are a Slavic nation, so they're from the same people group as, as the Russians. And in Putin's mind, I think he's always seen Ukraine as being part of, you know, of, of, of the Russian sphere and wanting to have it back. Some of the eastern provinces have a high percentage of, of Russian people uh, living in them, and uh, and also because of the fact uh, that it is the breadbasket of Europe, and it puts Russia in a much closer proximity also to the Middle East. Think about it. If they take all of Ukraine, uh, they they can do whatever they want in the Black Sea. They only have to travel through the Straits in Turkey, and then they're in Israel. And uh, I, I think Turkey would be much more, even though they're officially still a NATO member, uh, if you look the direction that they've been drifting in, um, I, I have my doubts as to whether they would actually fight with NATO or if they'd be neutral or go with Russia. It, I think it's quite unpredictable at this point. But by controlling Ukraine and all of the Black Sea, there's just a little bit of, of Ro Romania and Moldova that touches on the, west, on the western part of the uh, Black Sea, but they're not really... a a threat of any kind to, uh, to Russia. So they have a straight shot into the Middle East. And of course, they already have a presence, a strong presence in Syria as a military advisors. A lot of people are not aware of that. And uh, over the years, uh, Russia has pretty much run uh, the couple of uh, naval bases along the Mediterranean in, uh, uh, along the Mediterranean in Syria. And so Russia has a presence there. Iran has a strong presence in Syria, especially just on the other side of the Golan Heights in Israel. And so um, if Iran is emboldened by Russia's move and thinking, you know, the West can't do that much, we're already somewhat isolated. We have other people we can sell oil to other countries uh, such as China. And, uh, and that's what Russia is probably, probably going to do. Uh, whatever oil we don't purchase from them, uh, China will probably pick up the tab on that. And, and so what is happening right now in Ukraine is also, I think, going to serve to possibly embolden Iran and also China with Taiwan. So this is much bigger than, than I think we can get our, our arms around right now, what is unfolding. You know, it, it, it started very quickly a couple of days ago, and I think as things set in, we'll begin to uh, realize the, the hugeness of, of this event. If just a few things go wrong, this could trigger a World War III kind of thing, or at least a major regional conflict. That's not outside the realm of possibility. Um, in fact, um, in my book, I, I'm pretty sure in chapter, in chapter uh, seven, the coming world crisis, yeah. um, I mentioned that years ago, Albert Pike, 
who was at the time uh, the leader of Scottish Rite Freemasonry in the United States and believed to be the second highest Freemason in the world at that time, along with uh, Giuseppe Mazzini out of Italy, uh, who was probably the highest. Uh, the two of them pretty much ran things. And in a letter between the two of them, an infamous letter, uh, they laid out three major world crises or conflicts that they believe would be necessary to finally get the world to em embrace a global system of government. And of course, the first two are easy to identify, World War I and World War II. So um, if these people have their way, the, the, the globalists, they'll do whatever it takes to bring about their agenda. They're, commi they're, they're as committed or more committed to their agenda than probably many or most Christians are to Christ. Now, I realize that's saying a lot, but I, I believe that. These people are, they're hell bent on, on getting this done. And um, so if it takes a war to bring the world to its knees economically, and so that the, the World Economic Forum can introduce their new system that they're wanting to bring in, and uh, they already have the technology also in place uh, to tag every one of us with a type of mark using quantum dot technology. I just did an article on that. Uh, we posted it on our website. It's called the COVID Agenda and Mark of the Beast technology. You can find it, uh, if not on the homepage, it'll be in the archive section. I document this, the technology that is there. They've been experimenting with it in West Africa for almost two years now. And what you will see, and I know I'm going down a rabbit trail, but this is important. They, they want to bring in a, a system where all of us are given a digital ID together with a, a digital uh, COVID passport containing that information. And this would also be a means to buy and sell, all combined into one that they would put onto our bodies. Now, I don't know if they'll do that initially. They may just use smartphones to do it, but ultimately they're actually working on these kind of like a laser tattoo that would be invisible unless it's scanned over with a scanner. And then it would tell the computer system that yes, you're in the system. It would give them a vaccination status um, and, um, and you'd be able to then either buy or sell using that. Um, the Gates Foundation has been heavily involved in funding that. Um, there are three main groups. Uh, one is GAVI, the Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunizations, G-A-V-I, remember that, very influential organization, GAVI. And that organization uh, has been heavily funded over the years by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and a few others. Along with GAVI, there's an organization called Trust Stamp. This is the technology side of things. They're working on the technology for all of this. Um, and then there's also MasterCard. That's the financial side. So you have a type of threefold alliance, financial, technology, and health. And they're all together working on this in Africa right now. And by now, I imagine they've pretty much perfected it and they would be ready to go with it. But you can't just launch this on the people of the world. They would resist it. So there's got to be a reason for why they have to do this uh, in order to get people to buy into it. Um, so again, Satan is a great deceiver, right? We know that. He, he sets the stage. He lures people in, 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 into a trap. And uh, I've been so careful over the years to try not to come across like a conspiratorialist. But then I thought, you know what? You look at, at, at what Satan has done, what's recorded in the Bible. He conspired against God with a third of the angels. He conspired against God with Adam and Eve by telling them, God didn't really mean that. You can eat of this fruit and introduced sin. Uh, he conspired to the point where at the building of the Tower of Babel, God had to directly intervene and scatter them. Or before that, the flood, uh, things got to the point where God had to destroy most of his creation and start over again with, with uh, uh, Noah and his family. So there's been a spiritual battle since the, the creation of, of, of man on this earth. And it is a conspiracy. It's a satanic conspiracy. I believe that's a completely fair statement. And so Satan has his minions on this earth that are doing his bidding 
some of them unwittingly, uh, many of them knowingly, and they are warring against um, the truth, against God's truth. And Christians in this world who are the Lord's ambassadors in this world, uh, taking a stand for the truth. So none of this really should surprise us. Uh, but sometimes I, I realize I too, I have to pinch myself. Is this all really happening? You know, because um, it may mean we're, we're in the final years of, of world history. I do believe that uh, if things continue to move forward at this speed, but the opportunities are also great to share the gospel. And in my opinion, it should be easier to believe the truth of the Bible and the existence of God and Jesus today than at any other point in history, because the very prophecies that were given, some of them thousands of years ago, are now coming to fruition. So we serve a God who knew ahead of time all these things were going to happen down to the last detail, um, even to the point of there being a mark that you would need to buy and sell. And uh, I've known now for at least the last, about two years that indeed, that technology is in existence and it's it's getting closer. So all that um, in in a different kind of way, I suppose, should be an encouragement to us. Uh, I believe the words of the Bible now more than ever, given where we stand in world history and the fact that um, none of this uh, has not been foretold by by God. What would you say, brother, uh, concerning uh, there will be some people who are listening who are very interested and believe everything that you're saying. They're not a Christian. Maybe they have doubts about the Bible. And I think you've already partly answered it there. But there's so many at this time. They really see what's going on. I, I'm shocked. And I, I've shared this with you before about New Agers, atheists. I am shocked in the past two years, the people who are getting born again, and coming to Christ, who two years ago had no thought of Christ. They didn't believe the Bible. They didn't want to live holy. They didn't want to be born again. They, even people who have cursed the name of Christ up to two years ago, they got born again because they saw all of these things coming to pass, which you have shared down over the years. And I've preached on so many times. And, and yet suddenly as they see our world changing, they have been startled to the point of running to scripture and seeking an answer. So what about a person who can see all of this? They see the mark, they see the chipping, they see the world government, they're against this. Maybe they believe in the innate goodness of man that we'll all overcome this, you know, that through our love and our kindness that we will be able to stop this. And there's many who are saying this, who think we'll unify and good will triumph, and yet they have not met Christ at the cross. Yes, there are people within the One World Movement, uh, some New Agers, some interfaithists who believe that we as humanity will take a quantum leap into a higher level of existence, and there will be this golden age, their version of a millennium that's going to come in. Um, but I believe just the opposite is, is going to happen. And again, I choose to believe the words of the Bible, the warnings of the Bible. And it, it doesn't say that things are going to get better, but only worse right up until the return of, of Jesus himself. It will require his return to put a stop to the evil of man. And um, so I would just encourage people who are watching or listening, who, who've been involved in the New Age movement, uh, or maybe you've dabbled in the occult and different belief systems, um, to come to the cross and, and, and embrace Jesus. Um, he has paid the penalty for your sins. And if he wouldn't have done that, we would have no hope. Um, God has to, has to protect the perfection of heaven. That's why a third of the angels who became wicked had to be cast out. God cannot tolerate sin in heaven. So we as, as sinners, it's in our DNA now, we're born into sin as, as humans. But God sent Christ as a perfect man, God-man, to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross. And that was sufficient for God. That met his, his standard. And so the only way we can gain eternal life in heaven is by 
embracing that truth, accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior, and repenting of our sins. And repenting doesn't mean that we will be perfect from now on. Each of us is going to have a sin nature until the day we die or until the Lord re returns and, and translates us. But we need to intentionally move away from our sins and surrender them and walk with the Lord. Um, I just wrote down a few notes here that I, I um, wanted to be sure to hit on. First of all, the importance of repentance. You know, so many people call themselves Christians, but after they accept Christ, they end up not li really living any differently than they did before and, and uh, live like much of the rest of the world, which then sends a terrible witness and example to non-Christians. They think, well, that person professes Christ, but they're not they're, you know, they're just as evil as anybody else I know. So there needs to be a difference in us. When we, when we decide to follow Christ, we need to repent and draw close to him. Secondly, we need to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Luke 10, 27 uh, makes that very clear. So it's not just a matter of saying, okay, I believe what Jesus did on the cross. I believe that. And so now I'm going to go to heaven. Um, but we keep a distance from God because we're maybe afraid of what he's going to call us to do. Um, maybe... You know, he wants to send some of us to the most remote parts of Africa. I don't know. I think most of us probably that won't be the case. But people have all kinds of reasons they give for why they, they don't really draw close to the Lord. But God created us for fellowship. He wants us to be close to him and to walk with him. And so um, we need to move in the direction of loving him wholeheartedly. And uh, And the next point goes hand in hand with that. And that is. Uh, to walk with the Lord and abide in him. Uh, Jesus talked about that in John 15, 5, uh, in, in uh, the area where he talked about, I am the vine, you are the branches. As long as you abide in me, you'll produce much fruit, but without me, you can do nothing. And um, unfortunately, Keith, I think that's a big problem in, in so many churches today. Um, you have professing Christians, but they're not really abiding in, in, in Christ and walking closely with him. And I mean, goodness, when you have the former president of the World Council of Churches who's involved in this organization I was talking about earlier, you know, trying to bring about world government, many of the mainline denominations reject our Bible prophecies. They say, oh, those were fulfilled 2,000 years ago, you know, and they stretch things and try to make it look like all that was fulfilled when we know in our hearts, when you read it, it's so convicting, you know, it's talking about uh, the present day. Yes, certain prophecies have been fulfilled, but many others are, are, are yet to come and we're coming into that time. And, um, and so we need to ab abide, walk closely uh, with Jesus and not follow the example of so many uh, leaders who call themselves Christians but uh, really aren't. And remember the passage I read early on, Jesus warned about deception taking place in the name of Christ in the last days. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could, it could be that the Antichrist himself steps on the scene somehow in the name of Christ. Um, uh, and I don't want to go too far down this path, but I will say this. Uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, is heavily involved in this one world movement. In fact, I'm, I'm glad I thought of that right now because it, this is such an important piece of everything. I wrote this article. Also, you can read it on our website. We posted it. It's called Pope Francis Facilitating the Globalist Agenda. And um, I'm just going to share one quick thing out of here. May I do that, Pastor? He is uh, working on launching an interfaith center in the United Arab Emirates in the capital city, Abu Dhabi, um, this will open up. It's being constructed right now. It will open up this year in a few months. I have a picture of it here in our, in our publication. It's called the Abrahamic Family House. And there is going to be a, a Jewish synagogue, an Islamic mosque, and a Christian church, and a type of convention center, all there located on the premises. 
And uh, this idea grew out of a document that he and uh, the Grand Imam Ahmed al Taib, who's thought by many people to be the top Islamic cleric in the world, he and the Pope worked on a document together. They drafted it jointly. It's called the Document of Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. Again, Document of Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. And this is a, an effort uh, to bring about an interfaithism, a coming together of the world's religions. And this current Pope is the person at the forefront of making that happen together with this Islamic cleric. And they're actually overseeing uh, the construction of this complex. And I'm sure we'll hear more about it once it's finished. I can't imagine the media won't give it some type of, of coverage. And just one statement, uh, this is a direct quote from a Vatican insider. This is an, an archbishop. He served under three or four different popes. He's probably close to 80 years old now. His name is Carlo M. Vigano, spelled V-I-G-A-N-O. He has openly opposed Pope Francis and his accomplices for about two years now, even accusing Francis of being the spiritual leader of the globalist movement. Again, this is not coming from me. This is coming from this individual. Here's just one of many statements he has made, a direct quote. He says, supranational organizations financed in large measure by the conspirators of this coup d'etat are interfering in the government of individual nations and in the lives, relationships, and health of billions of people. They are doing it for money, certainly, but even more so in order to centralize power so as to establish a planetary dictatorship. It is the great reset of the World Economic Forum, the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. It is the plan of the New World Order in which a universal republic enslaves everyone and a religion of humanity cancels faith in Christ, end quote. That sums it up. And um, this man has really... He's put himself on the line, speaking out against the current pope, not a very popular thing to do. Uh, but there are people in Protestant circles, too, who are endorsing this agenda through the World Council of Churches, which it has more and more moved in the direction of interfaithism. So be sure that you are a attending a Bible-believing church that is teaching the truth. Don't assume if you become a new Christian that you can walk into any church and hear the Bible taught truthfully. A vast majority of churches are not teaching the Bible today. They just aren't, and that's that's the truth. So a little plug there for Pastor Keith. If you live in proximity, go to his church. Amen. We, we love people who love the Word of God, love the person of Christ, and you know, Brother Gary, that, that's why I, I love and respect you over these years as well, is that you've always given Christ the place and, you know, any time over the years that you, you've spoken, you've always, you know, finished by pointing to the simplicity of walking with Christ and being in that intimate relationship. Also in your letter here about Russia and Ukraine, and this is an unusual answer when you think of politics in this hour. What is the answer for Ukraine? One of the lines that you write there is exhorting people to spend time on their knees repentantly crying out to the holy merciful God to intervene on their behalf and I think that's a very powerful statement we can touch heaven and we can touch God and it's remarkable all that you've shared tonight and that you do over the years it's isn't it like it's almost converging like the one world religion the papacy the new world um, um, movement You've got the new world order, you've got world government, you've got all of this. Does it seem to you after writing your first book in 91, and this is one of the questions from one of the folk is, having written this in 91 and watching these past 30 years, in fact, this is your 30th uh, uh, year for the ministry, isn't it? It must be remarkable to look back. You must feel something like this is it. And I know at the end of 2020, after preaching for many years, 25 years, 
I suddenly felt for the first time in all the years preaching, I, I, I started to say, this is it like, this is all we've looked forward to, our seen in prophecy, our scene coming. It's like, this is really it. And it's not imagination. Yes, it's, it's not imagination. Um, as far as globalism goes, these people are very determined. They have a lot of money behind them. And I think they've gone too far to now just turn back. Uh, for one thing, I think many of them would go to jail as the truth comes out about what they've been perpetrating. And they're determined not to let that happen. So they're going to continue to push forward. And I think just as the Bible indicates, um, things seem to speed up the closer we get. And things come in like a flood, as scripture says. And, um, and so with that, though, there are going to be these opportunities, uh, like I mentioned, uh, to do great exploits and, and to reach many people with the truth. And it, it is so interesting to your point earlier that it's many of the people who've been in, involved in the new age and the occult who are now coming to Christ. W whereas many people who've been calling themselves Christians for years, they're kind of drifting down this path and going with this, this one world narrative. Um, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Sometimes we, we have friends whose children grew up actually in Bible believing churches who are now going completely the other way. They've completely rejected the truth and, and are going with this new world order. Uh, many of them got conditioned through the university system. They went, went in, at least to some degree, believing and came out uh, completely changed, radically going in a, in a, in a different direction. So if you, if you have any teenagers right now, really be careful of where you send them to school um, we, we, we try to be very careful with that, with our own kids and, um, our middle daughter, who's, who's very much on fire for the Lord right now, uh, went to Moody Bible Institute and, and she had some really excellent professors at that time. And she has a real passion for the Lord. And I hope that some of those institutions stay sound, but you know, even institutions like, like Moody Bible Institute, who do you believe Satan's going to target to try to get a hold of, you know, there's a constant effort to try to get uh, uh, progressive professors into these circles who, who twist the Bible and, and the truth. So it's an ongoing uh, battle. But um, I don't want to say it's, it's satisfying that the things I wrote about 30 years ago are now all happening. Um, but it, in a way it is, I mean, we realize we're getting closer to the time of the end and the return of, of Jesus, but we also realize we're heading into darker times between now and then, and that it's going to become more difficult for, for Christians. I just wish people would have listened 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, now it's so far along. Um, I don't believe it's going to be, be stopped. Maybe it, it could be delayed for a time if enough people are awakened uh, that we might be able to practice our freedoms and spread the gospel freely uh, without being in difficult situations. But right now it's unfolding uh, quite rapidly. Um, two or three weeks ago, Audrey, would you say, when did I hear from that individual from the state? Uh, about a month ago, I guess. Uh, a company that I assisted back when I worked for the state government. This gentleman, the, the name rang a bell, but I didn't remember it right away. Somehow he found my email and he contacted us to apologize. He said, I don't know if you remember the last conversation that I had with you back in 1984, and you shared with me about some of these global developments that were taking place, and I just wrote it off. I thought you were absolutely crazy and that none of this would ever happen, especially not in the United States of America. And he said, I just, I want to apologize. Would you forgive me? Would you accept my apology? Because everything you said is true and it's happening now. And so I, I wrote him a, a, an email back and I said, no, no need to apologize. I, you know, you're, you're like almost everybody else back in those days, you know, who, who just found it difficult to believe. And maybe the only reason I believed it was because it was hands on. You know, I was in meetings with these people and saw it and, and I felt convicted, especially because of, of uh, the commitment I made to the Lord at a very young age. And, um, so anyway, I feel very blessed and fortunate that we learned about these things when we did, and the Lord has been so merciful and gracious uh, to give us 30 day, 30 years. Um, last month, it was 30, 
30 years since since uh, my first book came out. And so there's been ample time to to warn people. Um, many people have rejected it. Other people have listened. We just have to do our part and leave the rest to the Lord. You know, we can't make it personal. We just have to speak the truth. If people uh, want to believe us, that's wonderful. If they don't, um, we just do our best to leave it there. Brother, could we uh, maybe finish with people's questions? And uh, just as we do go to people's questions, um, I just want to note that uh, earlier when I was flicking through your book again, and with the coming crisis that you mentioned, you actually place, and this is in 91 when you published this, or 92, um, you place Syria right at the center of it. Back then, you said looking forward at the possible scenarios of the nation's maneuvering, and uh, you really honed in on Syria and said somehow Syria is going to be right in the midst of, of this. And I think when we're being careful, researching, sticking to scripture, it's amazing how um, we can become almost like prophets in these things, that God really does bless us by warning of things to come. But I, I want to give just a few questions. First of all, Ken has asked tonight, do you think that the crisis, the present crisis in Ukraine could be a precursor to Ezekiel's war in chapter 38? And also, um, uh, well, in fact, just answer that first, and then I, I've got a few others here. Um, I, I believe it's very possible, um, especially since you see things heating up in the Middle East. The headlines have been grabbed by what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and the whole COVID thing and other things. Uh, but there's been a lot going on in the Middle East as well. In fact, uh, the Israelis have, have uh, had to fire into Syria a couple of times to try to take out some uh, positions where the Iranians were um, establishing certain offensive positions uh, targeting Israel. Uh, also, there's a huge buildup in, in southern Lebanon. Uh, what makes it more difficult there for the IDF in Israel is that a lot of these rockets are being placed within civilian areas uh, by civilians in southern Lebanon that are largely innocent, innocent individuals. I mean, it's diabolical. So Israel can't really take out those rockets without doing a lot of collateral damage to civilians. But there are tens of thousands of rockets aimed at, um, at Israel in, in southern Lebanon, uh, which is now completely under the control of Iran and, and, and Syria. And then, of course, there's Hamas to the, to the west, um, for the first time um, in my lifetime, I believe, uh, the forces against Israel have a, a straight run into Israel coming from the east and, and the north. Um, think with me for a moment geographically. I'll, I'll try to do this. This is east, right? The way you're looking at it, and this is west. Correct? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to look at it as if I'm seeing myself in the mirror. Anyway, uh, coming from the east, you've got Pakistan, followed by Afghanistan, which is now completely in, in the whole, you know, held by a terrorist regime. Um, then Iraq, and then Syria, and Lebanon, and right there is Israel. And, and Russia, if it fully takes Ukraine, like I said, it only has Turkey in between, and Turkey could well end up being allied with, with Russia because they hate Israel. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. Israel actually had a, a pretty good relationship with Turkey, uh, but that's not the case now. So the stage is very, very close to being set, and um, it wouldn't take much to, to trigger it. If, if, if Russia uh, is able to do what they do in, in Ukraine, it could be you know, within, within weeks or months, uh, Iran may try something, uh, possibly through Syria. And if Israel sees it coming, you know, they, they have excellent intelligence. I think Israel probably would know if Syria is going to launch uh, at Israel because they only have four minutes to respond before a missile would be over Jerusalem. So they have to be dead on in their intelligence. If there were to be a nuclear device, that they believe is going to be launched at them from Damascus, they would they would strike first in a preemptive strike, and and that could you know that could be 
the fulfillment of um, Isaiah 17, chapter 1, which says an, an oracle concerning Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. Well, we've already seen what's happened to some of the other cities in Syria. Um, I mean, it, they're basically in ruins, but Damascus has been relatively unscathed. So at some point, that prophecy is yet going to be fulfilled. Uh, as things stand right now, Damascus is the oldest standing major city in the world that has never been uh, destroyed, massively destroyed. So uh, Ezekiel 30, uh, 37, 38, 39, that, that could be very close to being fulfilled as well as the prophecy in Isaiah 17, uh, 1, and, and perhaps some others as well. Yeah, amazing, brother. Um, someone, someone asked there, could this then be a smokescreen? So the whole world's eyes are on Ukraine at the minute while all of this is happening. Well, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, but anything that happens in the Middle East probably would un unfold quite rapidly. Uh, because if it involves Israel, it will make the international media. You see, Israel can get hit by rockets from Hamas for two weeks, and you don't see anything in it in the international media. But then when Israel finally decides to defend itself and strike back in 10 minutes, it's, it's in all the international media. Um, so uh, it takes a little bit of effort to see what the other countries surrounding Israel are, are up to. But once Israel becomes involved, everybody will know it. Yeah. Someone has asked, um, do you think it's likely that this moves beyond Ukraine. Would Russia um, politically in its mindset, is there other nations in the Baltic states or in around Ukraine that Russia ha would have a tendency to invade at this time? I think for, the, for a time, they're going to have their hands full with Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is putting up a bigger fight, I think, than, than a lot of people imagined. And um, so if he goes into another country, uh, Putin would have to know that it would be a relatively easy takeover uh, because if he has to become an occupier in Ukraine, that's different than just overthrowing the administration and putting a puppet in. If he has to literally occupy U Ukraine, that's going to take a lot of resources. And he's a very calculating individual. Um, so I think part of it depends on how things go in Ukraine. If everybody lays down their weapons within a couple of weeks and it's over, um, maybe he'd be inclined to, to go further. But right now, um, you know, NATO forces are going into the Baltic countries. The announcement was made just a few hours ago. I think 7,000 more troops. Um, the U.S. is sending troops into Germany uh, to be on call there. And NATO is sending uh, several thousand troops into the Baltic uh, states. And... Um, uh, Romania probably would be the easiest to take. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, but that would give uh, Russia complete control all the way around the Black Sea. And so strategically, uh, if I was in Romania, I'd be a little bit uneasy right now. And militarily, it would probably be the, the easiest country to take as well. And we have friends in, in both those countries, in, in Romania as well as in Ukraine. And um, so we have really been praying uh, for these people. And, uh, and we have friends in Russia as well. Uh, in fact, um, I forgot all about this, but just yesterday I thought of this. My book was translated into Russian in Kiev. Our Christian publisher is in Kiev. This was about probably 18, 17, 18 years ago. It's been a while. And from Kiev, my book went out to Christian leaders throughout Russia and Ukraine by the thousands. I mean, it, it really, the, the Lord got the message out there. All that happened from Kiev. Uh, so our publisher's there. Uh, the uh, attorney that we worked through is there, a, a dear friend, um, and a, a gal who became like an adopted daughter to us that we met in Ukraine, and she came to the U.S., married a, a pastor. She's now a pastor's wife in the state of Washington. Uh, uh, she, her, her sister is still over there. Our son, who just got married a few months ago, the best man in his wedding, 
Uh, his father is a pastor in Ukraine. He's a, a Ukrainian pastor's son. So I could go on and on. We have a lot of uh, contacts in Ukraine. I've been there twice. I spoke at one of their large churches in downtown Kiev uh, years ago. So um, more than any other country um, in, in Europe, probably, we have contacts in Ukraine. So it hits close to home as we think through all these people that we know who are still over there. Uh, the translators we've used when we've been in Ukraine. But also in Russia, there are a lot of uh, Russian pastors who read my book and, and responded, who are Bible-believing Christians in Russia, all over Russia. And, and so, you know, war is ugly. I mean, you've got people on both sides, some of them Christians uh, out there on, on the front lines who, who are dying, uh, who in some cases are, you know, fighting against each other because, because of this war situation. And um, uh, we, we need to pray for all of them, that the bloodshed would be limited, and that um, Christian believers somehow in the midst of all this uh, could, be, could be peacemakers and, and take advantage of every opportunity they have to lead people uh, to accept Christ um, as their Savior. Amen. Amen. Anaj, you've emphasized a couple of times the greatest days are just ahead. There's some. This is an hour for us as Christians to do great exploits for the Lord. And I know my heart is greatly stirred over that, that we are in the last chapter of church history. Someone has asked, as the globalist agenda begins to unfold at a faster pace, in your opinion, how long is it until they come for our Bibles and for those who walk with Christ? That, that all depends. Um, because right now we still have those freedoms here. You have those freedoms over there. Um, and even in Russia, you know, when I smuggled Bibles in there years ago, I could have gotten into a lot of trouble for doing so. But we've had friends who were actually missionaries in Russia for quite a while. And, and there's been an openness there. Um, but... I do realize these globalists, they, they see Bible-believing Christians as being their greatest obstacle. So I think, first of all, they will continue to do everything they can to fight the prophecies of Scripture and say that doesn't really mean what it says. And, uh, and when it comes time for the, for the actual mark of the beast, that's not really what the Bible said. In fact, <sighs> I don't know if I want to go there or not. That's quite a rabbit trail. Um, anyway, I, I believe the stage is being set even for Christians to be drawn into these false narratives and, and these deceptions. And it's quite effective, especially if, if the mass media catches on to that. You know, I mean, they can pretty much drive our narrative. If you watch the evening news and, and all the networks are saying pretty much the same thing, you kind of think, well, that's how it must be, you know. They can establish the tempo and, and the truth. So much of it depends on how many of us as believers accept that, or we say, no, we're not going to be deceived by this. Things are really quite different from what we're being told, and then take a stand as much as, as we can. Um, but I do believe these people are quite determined. They'll, they'll push forward uh, a step here and a step there and keep moving uh, in their direction that they want to take us in as long as they have an opening. Um, Right here in the U.S., we have elections coming up in November, and people are quite fed up with Biden. If he were if he were to run today, which he wouldn't in November anyway, because he'd only be two years in, but people allied closely with him, if they were to run today, many of them would lose if it were to happen today. And the globalists understand that very well. So I believe in our country they want to accomplish as much as possible in the next eight months. If they, if they could, they would try to bring in their entire agenda by the time of, of the election. Um, or if they can't, if the election goes badly for them, they still have two months before the newly uh, elected officials take their positions. That happens in January. So they would have from early November into, into January, and so a lot of things could still happen then. So a lot of the believers that I'm in, in contact with here in the United States uh, who are in positions of, of authority and influence, 
uh, that's their concern right now is the next 10 months because they, they, they realize that much is on the line. That's why the globalists are pushing so hard. If we get to the elections and they turn out unfavorable and these new people actually get put in power, then there can be a significant pushback that could uh, counter this agenda and, and um, uh, perhaps uh, you know, give us some more days of freedom, so to put it. But we also realize this is, this is global. This is taking place all around the world. It's not just what's happening in the United States, although a lot of what's happening here kind of sets the tempo for much of the rest of the world. Uh, so it's important that we all are in prayer. And my heart's desire would be that we have more years of freedom, obviously, right? I mean, all of us would want, want that to be the case. Uh, but if, if that is not how things unfold, um, we must realize that we will still have some opportunities, but under more difficult circumstances. Um, when, when everything first came out with the Great Reset and with Klaus Schwab uh, two years ago, when that was first released, did you immediately identify it as a part, just a, another step in all that you've looked at over these 30 years? Was it a very obvious the, the people involved, the institutions, what they were saying, was it very obvious at that point? Y yes, it was. Um, because many of the people that I've been tracking for years and some that I even wrote about in my book are major members of the World Economic Forum. You know, it caters to the Rockefeller crowd, to the Soros crowd. Um, uh, Klaus Schwab was, was a protege of Henry Kissinger, Klaus Schwab being the founder of the World Economic Forum. He was a, he was a protege of Henry Kissinger, uh, who was very tight with the Rockefeller family and helped to found the Trilateral Commission with the Rockefellers, uh, which is a very one world globalistic type of, of organization. Uh, so that goes back uh, to the 70s. Um, Maurice Strong of Canada, was a co-founder of the World Economic Forum with Klaus Schwab. He worked for the Rockefellers. He owed his wealth uh, to their oil empire. Um, so it goes back to the same money people and, and their web of influence. Um, the other thing that was interesting, his book came out just after the COVID pandemic started. This was a lengthy book. Uh, very thorough, well written, and suddenly it's it's out and published a couple months later. There's no way he could have done that. I don't care how smart he is. It takes time. I know how much time it takes to get a book published, even from the time you hand in the manuscript till it's out there and printed. He, I believe, he wrote that book before the pandemic even started, knowing about it, knowing what was going to come, and had it ready to go. Um, these people are planners, they're master planners. Uh, Bill Gates, who's a big part of the forum. Many people are not aware of the fact that his father was on the board of directors of Planned Parenthood, uh, which if you're not familiar with, are you familiar with that organization over there in Europe? It, it provides massive numbers of abortions here in the United States. It's uh, the number one organization known for uh, numerically for the abortions here in the United States. Uh, Bill Gates' father was uh, involved in that, and the family has a history of eugenics. And to find out that not only is Bill Gates uh, very uh, influential in the World Economic Forum, but that he has been leading the charge uh, with these vaccines and funding many of them, I don't know how you feel about it, but to know that Gates's family has been involved in eugenics and, and openly talking about depopulating the planet. I have Gates making statements. I have the quotes, some of them uh, a very powerful one just six or seven years ago, talking about a, a drastic reduction in, the, in uh, the population of the world. And now this man, he's going to fund all these vaccines to save everybody on the planet. I'd be a little bit skeptical about that. Um, so you've got some very um, shady characters, very powerful figures nonetheless involved in all of this, not just on the economic side of things, but also on, on the, the COVID side of things. 
And, and then you have people like George Soros, who I don't know how that guy is still walking freely, you know, how he is not in jail with everything that he has supported financially. Um, but he is. And, and I think these people have a lot of influence and control, even with our court system, because some of these people, uh, the cases are made, but then when it gets to the prosecution level, the judges strike it down. And you may wonder, how did that come to be? How did the courts become so corrupt that these wicked people, it seems, can no longer be prosecuted and they just have, uh, you know, freedom to do all these things? I stumbled onto the answer to that as well when I was working on my first book. I discovered that here in the, in the United States in the 1960s, when many of the Supreme Court decisions were made that worked against Christianity and that still affect us negatively to this day, of the nine Supreme Court justices, eight of them were Freemasons. And the Supreme uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Warren uh, was his last name, was the highest ranking Freemason in the state of California at the time. So he served in that capacity and was also the Chief Justice of our Supreme Court here in the United States. Now, regardless of what you think about Freemasonry, good or bad, when you see eight out of nine justices belong to the same organization, to a Christian with any level of discernment at all, that should throw up flags. Um, you know, what are the odds, let's just say, uh, the, uh, the largest evangelical church group in the United States is the Southern Baptist Convention. And I forget the exact number of, of members that they have, but let's say it's three million. It's probably bigger than that. What would, how would the mass media respond if they discovered one day that eight out of nine of our Supreme Court justices are all Southern Baptists? Boy, you would hear it every night in the news. That'd be the number one story until it was corrected. But not so when it's Freemasonry or when it's certain other groups. Um, I did some research uh, taking, taking, taking us back to World War II. I took a look, a look at all the people who held the top four positions in the executive branch of our government here in the United States. That would include the president, secretary of state, secretary of defense, and national security advisor, and secretary of treasury. So I, I looked at five different positions. And when I wrote, at the time I wrote my book, which would have been what, 40, it came out 46 or 47 years after World War II, in that space of time, the people who had held those top five positions, 80% of them belonged to one of two organizations, the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral Commission. And those groups together numbered only about 3,000 people. So all of our top leaders, 80% of our top leaders belonged to a small tight-knit group of about 3,000 people over a period of 45 years. Again, where are our investigative journalists to bring this out to the forefront. You know, I mean, that's just a logical question to ask. What's going on here? And so these are the kinds of things that have been covered up. And the only way they could do so is by having uh, control of the media and to a large extent of our court system, our judicial system. And, uh, and that's how they've, they've been able to get to this point. I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, brother. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish here with one question, and it may seem to be a bit different than the others are just going off track, but I think it's very essential, a very important question. We've looked at um, one world government, one world religion, one world economy, all of these one world things. But I, I just want to bring this last question down. Very good question. We're getting a wee bit of feedback, um, but it's on education, one world education, just in reference to Robert Mueller with the United Nations, maybe most people won't understand this question necessarily, but this question that was given by a brother who read both of your books just recently, and his question was about the core curriculum uh, within America. Now, Robert Mueller wrote the world core curriculum that came in through the United Nations. Is the core curriculum that was used across America, um, 
did it come out of that? Was it connected? Was there some sort of connection? This brother spoke with his father recently who said that when the core curriculum came into America, it seemed the education of the kids changed, that there was no more questioning. Um, there was a lot of complications come in and a lot of older teachers left education in America in Oklahoma in the 90s. So this brother just wants to know, was there a connection in this new world curriculum coming into the education system? Okay, first of all, just a little bit about the world core curriculum. I go into it in, in detail. And on page 176 in my second book, I reproduced a title page from the world core curriculum, just so that seeing is believing. And uh, Robert Mueller, who was heavily tied into the United Nations and who was involved actually in organizing Pope John Paul II's trip to the United States and the meeting at the United Nations. He's in the middle of all that. Um, he was involved in this, but it was actually a friend of his who was in, uh, even more involved in drafting much of the specific wording. And that person's name was Gloria Crook, C-R-O-O-K, and it's mentioned on the title page here. And on the title page, uh, she dedicates the World Core Curriculum to Alice Bailey. Uh, in fact, she quotes from her book, Education in the New Age, from page 122. And um, Alice Bailey was the founder of Lucifer Publishing Company. I believe I mentioned it earlier. Again, this is, it's almost unbelievable, but I, I have this documented forward and, and, and backwards in, in my book, The New World Religion. And so these Robert Mueller schools, um, he, he put schools up all around the country uh, with his name uh, that were teaching the world core curriculum with this lady, Gloria Crook, who is the main organizer of all that. Um, they so saturated the field of public education through our university system and the teachers that they were putting out that basically what has happened is a good percentage of the curriculum we have now that our kids are taught in the public schools in America. There is not much of a difference between it and the world core curriculum. So it's come full cycle in about 30 years time. And um, it, it took some conditioning. You know, the older teachers that taught math and English and history the right way, they had to retire and gradually be replaced by teachers who became activists. Rather than teachers, they are now political activists basically indoctrinating our kids. And uh, my wife was a public school teacher for 10 years. And there were still some good teachers back when she taught. Uh, she left in the mid nineties, uh, but already this was beginning to happen. It was quite under in transition at that uh, time. And you'd be surprised how many teachers in our public schools in America today are also involved in the new age in witchcraft and suddenly introduce their kids that they are teaching into these ideas. Um, and it's, it's really sad. Uh, we know of one gal who grew up in a Christian family, a good friend of mine, uh, very smart, brilliant mind, who is now into goddess worship. You know, it's hard to even believe uh, that she could make that kind of a jump, but she has. And, and so when people begin to compromise the truth and open themselves up, uh, Satan takes them one step at a time. They start out here and they end up way over here somewhere. And um, that's the biggest problem we face is those in our country who are 35 to 40 years old or younger. As of a year ago, I saw a survey and about 70% of them view socialism favorably. Some of them don't even realize what socialism is. They just know that they favor these certain beliefs that they line up with. So it's very difficult to overcome that in an election because if, if that younger crowd gets out and you know, 80, 90% of them vote, then somehow you have to be able to offset that vote and there aren't enough conservatives left in the US to do it. So I, I know of Christians in the last election who were praying that God would somehow tie up all the progressives with bad weather, a bad case of the flu or anything it took so that they could not make it to the polls because it is so difficult to overcome that now. So we need to pray for our young people, especially those who begin to have younger families and they realize how difficult it is to raise a family and reality begins to set in, that they're able to turn away from their more socialistic ideals 
and move in a more pol politically conservative direction. And, and not just that, but they, that they would embrace the teachings of the Bible and, and come to know Christ as Lord. That's the most important thing. Thank you, brother. Um, we're we're going to just hold it there on questions. I know so many of you have so many other questions and uh, we could just keep going like this, but we're going to bring this um, down to an end now. And uh, Brother Gary, we really do appreciate you. And I know I've already said that, but um, I really do thank you for the stand that you've made through the years. And certainly I know for me, being a young man, listening to these things, growing up through, having to find my own way in the call of God, I look back and I know what it takes to stand. Um, and you can't even measure or convey sometimes what, what the call of God and answering his call very specifically, what it can cost, what it can mean. And uh, I know Audrey is, I, I think at least she was off camera there. Uh, we appreciate her as well. We, we'd love a look at her. I'm not sure if she wants to come and say hello. She may not want to. We... <laughs> She's shaking her head. She didn't know yeah. she was going to be on camera. Well, well, but... I, I'm, gl I'm glad she's there. And to both of you, we, we thank God for you. We pray for you. We have been praying for you this week. And we're going to continue to pray for you, for your health and for God's blessing. There's a vital hour. And it's so evident by your testimony at the beginning of your father, your mother, just God laying those principles into their hearts, knowing that you would be here at this hour and this time. And I don't think that's accidental. And we pray that for whatever time all of us have, that God is really going to bless and give great wisdom and open doors, even through this video as it goes out, that uh, the Lord will really touch lives, that this is going to reach the right people at the right time to accomplish the right thing. And I know how important it was you taking the time with me just to show me that map in that document, to show it was a UN stamp, and to give the facts, the evidence, the research, and to convey that, that has even impacted many of the messages that I preach from the pulpit and expound in the word of God. It just give light, it give insight. So I'm so grateful. Um, we do stand with you praying for God's blessing upon you. Maybe as we close, could I ask you to pray just for all of those who are in the church now and online, as well as those who listen afterwards. Uh, there are those listening now who don't know Jesus. And we'd love you to pray for them. This could be the most vital hour of their life. And uh, also for Christians who are going to stand and face the heat of this hour, we'd love for your prayer. And if you're okay with it, I would love on behalf of everyone here just to pray for you as well after for God's blessing upon you. Will do. And all glory and praise be to God for any good uh, that has come uh, out of my book and messages and also of this message here. We're just... Um, asking God that he would spread it far and wide and that many would come to receive uh, the truth of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for giving all of us a chance. Um, Lord, when man sinned, you could have allowed all of us uh, to go to hell, but you didn't. You intervened by sending your son to pay the penalty on our behalf, Lord. So it's not of works. There's nothing we can do to earn our way into heaven. It's, it's truly a gift. And God, we thank you and praise you for making us a part of your family and, and what you are doing and, and giving us the opportunity to be with you for all of eternity. But right now, Lord, you've given us a work to do on this earth, this fallen world that we live in, to share the truth, and so I ask, Lord, that you would quicken our hearts, that you would give us boldness, that we would not know fear as the world knows fear, rather that we would be respecters of you, but that we would not fear those who could harm the body, but do nothing to our souls. And that you would open doors, give us discernment, Lord, to know what to speak, who to speak to, when to say what, 
that would further your truth and your kingdom on this earth, Lord. We pray now specifically for those who may hear this message who do not know you. They have not repented of their sins. They have never asked for forgiveness. They have not believed on you that you are the only provision for them to enter heaven and to be in the presence of God. We ask, Lord, that you, would, that you would move on their hearts right now, that you would convict through the power of your Holy Spirit, that they would know in the depths of their hearts that what they have heard is the truth, that this is not made up, and that your word, the Bible, is not simply words written by interesting men thousands of years ago, but that it tells the true story of the God that we serve and the kind of God that you are and who wants to rescue man. Lord, let that set in and take hold of their hearts, that they would embrace Jesus Christ as their one and only Savior, and that they would commit the rest of their lives to him. And if you are one of these listeners right now, we're just going to be silent for a moment and give you an opportunity to pray directly to our Lord God in the name of Jesus and ask him to save you and make you his child. Do it right now. In Jesus' name, seal this, Lord. Bring these new believers into a tight relationship with you, that they would grow quickly, Lord, that what normally might take years, that they would come into full maturity within a matter of weeks and months, Lord, that they are walking so closely with you, that they could then in turn spread your good news, your gospel to the ends of the earth, Lord. This is what we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. I want to pray for your brother and sister, and we do appreciate you just simply as we close here. And we, we love you very sincerely. We care about you and just really pray for the hand of God upon you. Father, we do thank you for our brother who has shared tonight. Father, thank you for the stand, for having prepared him as a child, keeping your hand upon his father and his mother and bringing them together in your plan and purpose. Father, we're in awe. We stand amazed at our God of grace, nor God who works even generations ahead of the need and the crisis. And Father, surely you were working all things together for good. And Father, I thank you, God, for Brother Gary, that you gave him a message that you prepared his heart, nor God for his wife, Audrey. Will you bless them in their physical bodies? Will you heal them? Will you quicken them? Will you strengthen them? Will you lift all the pressure off them? Will you provide for them even financially? Lord God, go ahead of them. And Lord God, open effectual doors that are going to be so vital to the kingdom of God, to souls, to your church in this hour. Lord God, you have prepared this man for this hour. Lord God, with all of these things at his hand. And Father, I pray even make hours and moments and days, Lord God, to be so vital in his his life at this time. And Father, we pray, we agree together as we close this meeting together. And Lord God, we pray for the blessing of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob upon their family, their children, their grandchildren. And Lord God, just let your presence be so real in their home. You know their desires, their thoughts, their worries. Lord God, you know everything going on with them. And we pray, reveal yourself, pour out your spirit upon them, revive their hearts so God, strengthen them and encourage them. And Father, we thank you for this message tonight, that you'd set your seal upon it, that we're going to hear of your impact upon individual lives and saving them and bringing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for Jesus. 
thank you for the finished work of the cross. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's not long until we're going to be in your presence. We love you with all of our heart. We are longing. We're saying, Maranatha tonight, come, Lord Jesus, but help us to be faithful to do the will of God in this last hour, this last chapter of church history, that you might receive of all the glory and the praise and the honor that is due to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you. It's been very Thank precious. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's been just an honor and a privilege. And I thank you for this opportunity. And I know the Lord will use all of you who are listening uh, to get this message out and to be bold witnesses for him. So we'll be praying for you as well from this side of the pond. Amen. Thank you, brother. And we look forward to when you visit uh, Ireland. And uh, But you're only allowed to come if you bring Audrey with you uh, for a break. I would definitely do that. And by the way, she's a very wonderful, beautiful woman. You can take my word for it, even though you can't see her. Amen. God bless you. I, 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 know what, I know what Candace, my wife, is like as well. And we, brother, we sure couldn't do without them. Um, they, they, we'll, we'll, be, we'll continue to pray for Candace as well. Thank you. Thank you, brother. We have been. Amen. God bless you.